80% of CEOs did not trust their marketing people. And what they meant by that is that, I mean, they would trust them to watch their kids probably, but they didn't trust that marketers are in touch with the financial realities of their company. My name is Peter Sumpton, and you're listening to the Marketing Study Lab podcast, the podcast that gives you actionable marketing knowledge, getting you and your marketing in the best possible shape to be the driving force of your business for long-term success. From strategy and tactics to practical application, we've got it all covered. If you'd like to support the show, it'd be fantastic if you could leave a five-star Apple podcast review or get in touch especially if you have a burning marketing question. I'd love to chat it through with you. Email me, peter at marketingstudylab.co.uk. Or you can find me on LinkedIn. There's a link in the show notes if you can't be bothered searching on LinkedIn. So what are we going to learn and who's on Marketing Study Lab today? Some people collect sports memorabilia. Others collect music. Some even collect stamps. I think that's still a thing. But Douglas Burdett, our guest, collects sales and marketing books. If you've ever caught his own podcast, the Marketing Book Podcast, and if you haven't caught it, you're just a lunatic. But anyway, you'll know that Douglas not only collects them, gets them signed by the authors, and flies all over the US, if not the world, to do that, but reads at least one a week and then interviews the author. LinkedIn named it one of the top 10 podcasts that will make you a better marketer. And Forbes named it one of the 11 smart podcasts that will keep you in the know. So why the heck haven't you listened to it? I am delighted that Douglas could spare the time to chat about his collection of books, the knowledge he has gained from this, and provide us with not only a whole host of books we should be reading or should have read, but some tips on how to become a better reader. All the books that are mentioned in the episode can be found in the show notes. So if any take your fancy, get on it. And I suggest you really do, because some of those books are amazing. But first, I needed to ask Douglas, when you put a book down, do you use a bookmark, fold the page, or use the closest thing to hand? That's a very interesting question, one I've never had before, but I actually have an answer for that. And that cool. is because I have to, I have to, because I get to read a book, at least one book a week to prepare for each weekly interview. What I do is I have a stack of books over there of the upcoming books. And off of each one uh, on the cover is a post it note <clears throat> with the date of the interview on it. So I stack them all up chronologically. Then before I go home for the weekend, I grab the one on top of the stack because that's the one I need to read that weekend. And I use that post-it note as the bookmark. And I do that because the post-it notes don't tend to fall out. But I'm also known for my marketing book podcast, Bookmarks. So uh, I'll be sending you one. And if anyone oh, yes. else would like one, please uh, please let me know and I'll, I'll send one your way. Yeah, absolutely. So I do quite a bit of whiteboarding. And when I, when I, when I get things like that, I usually stick it on there so when I do a video things around there but obviously that's going to have more of a practical use than a sticker or something like that so definitely I look forward to receiving that brilliant glad I asked that question now yeah um, see you're benefiting and then if anyone else wants one uh they just need to connect with me on LinkedIn and share their mailing address and uh it's all theirs I'll even put a little something extra in there oh brilliant marvelous a, not marketing, gonna be... a, a marketing book laptop sticker but it doesn't have to go in your laptop Cool. Well, send me one of them and that will go on the whiteboard. Oh, excellent. All right. This is really Love coming it. together for me. <laughs> Brilliant. Love it. Let's get into it now. So what's the story that brings you to this point in your career? Uh, well, I have been in the agency business for just over 30 years now. And I was in the Army, uh, U.S. Army in Germany for three years after I was a finished at school and then um, got out and studied business and then decided I want to go into advertising. And uh, so was there for a number of years. And uh, then uh, I met my wife and our son was born there. And <clears throat> we ultimately moved to Virginia and worked in an agency for four years and then started my own uh, shop. And the 
the story is that it was it, I was always traditional advertising. In fact, um, when I was in grad school, after I was out of the Army, I started looking around for a different career. And I, a friend of mine I'd been in the Army with who lived in New York City, he said, you know, you ought to think about going into advertising. And I didn't know much about it. So I went to a professor and who had worked in advertising. I said, what's one book I could read? And she recommended one uh, by a famous uh, Scotsman, uh, David Ogilvy. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> and Ogilvy on advertising. And that was one of two books that really uh, transformed the trajectory of my career. So I did that for m many years. And even when I started my own firm, it was an advertising firm. But as a lot of your listeners will know, the advertising industry is a shadow of its former self. And so mm -hmm. I started to <clears throat> realize that that whole world was kind of going away probably like a travel agent 20 years ago thinking, hmm, what, how can they make travel plans without me? <laughs> so uh, I, did, I went back to what I was doing in grad school. Where I was reading a bunch of different books and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I stumbled upon a book called uh, oh, uh, The New Rules of Marketing and PR by David Merriman Scott. It was the first edition. It came out the same year as the iPhone that was introduced, which I think was 2009. And uh, that was the other book that just transformed it where I said, ah, oh, that's where the whole world is going. Now I understand. I felt like I had a second bite at the apple. I transformed my business towards, towards that world, away from advertising. We buy hardly any advertising now for clients. Uh, and at that point, I was so troubled by starting to feel irrelevant or like I was growing dinosaur scales <clears throat> that I said, I'm not going to stop reading these books. I have to do something to feel like I'm kind of keeping up because the velocity of change in this industry has really picked up and, and and continues to do so. So I kept reading the books and then I, you know, you probably have a lot of uh, signed sports memorabilia from the members of the Liverpool football club. <laughs> uh, I don't, but I collect autograph sales and marketing books. And so I would go to a conference and I would have already read their book on a electronic device, but I'd buy a copy of the book and I would put it in the suitcase, fly to the conference, just just because I knew I could get their autograph. So after a while, I uh, started listening to podcasts, and I always liked marketing podcasts, particularly books where they, uh, particularly episodes where they would interview authors. So um, I said, I want to try that. And I basically started the podcast that I wanted to listen to, hmm. which was interviewing authors of marketing and sales books. And so after about the first 10 interviews, I'd all read all those books. Only at that point, Peter, did I realize I was actually going to need to read every book for each interview. <laughs> uh -huh. So it was like taking the wrong exit on a interstate, or I don't know, you call it their motorway or something yeah, like that motorway, in yeah. the UK, and uh, realizing, oh, oh, okay, I wish I'd thought that through. So um, at any rate, uh, and yes, it has cut into my scotch drinking. So uh, <laughs> that's kind of where I am. So now I started, gosh, over five years ago. And I've had 260 something interviews. Uh, and uh, the podcast has been named by LinkedIn and Forbes as one of the top sales and marketing podcasts. And I do it kind of like your show, just because I love doing it. I've got a separate business on the side and I try not to spend too much time during the work week working on it. I read the books, you know, on the weekends. That's how I got to where I am. And that's, I hope that's the longest uh, answer I have to your, to your question. So at any rate, uh, and I have lots of, um, I know you have a lot of listeners in the UK, and um, the uh, second largest number of listeners I have is in the UK. And of course, I interview a lot of, uh, I, I get the, the, the honor and privilege of interviewing a lot of folks uh, in the UK. In fact, this uh, tomorrow, as we record today, this will, tomorrow I interview, uh, the, the interview I did with Rory Sutherland, who's the UK, uh, vice chairman of Ogilvy in the UK, mm -hmm. this interview will publish about his book, Alchemy. Wow, that's cool. Love it. Absolutely love it. That leads me nicely onto my next question. So I, really. hope we still have que I hope we still have time for your other <laughs> questions you might ask. Yeah, it does, but I've, I've ticked loads of them off. So pretty much all of them are about scotch now. So <laughs> yeah, I have so much to learn. And in answer to your unasked question, I always get this. What's your favorite scotch? Mm -hmm. The best tasting scotch is uh, free scotch. I think that's the dry humor coming through. But what we've been talking about leads me nicely on to my next question. And you, when you were um, practicing marketing, and I know you still do, but when, when you started and you were agency-based, uh, you started reading books, and then you've got a podcast about books. We have a lot of information at our fingertips. 
Why did you decide to focus on sales and marketing books and not just, say, successful marketers? Well, I guess because, as I mentioned before, I had read these books and, you know, the right book at the right time can have a dramatic effect. I mean, a lot of people can probably think back on a book they would have read, not just necessarily a business book, but some book that really had an impact on them. And I think that I got in the habit of reading them after I got out of the Army, and it was actually before the uh, World Wide Web came about. So this was in the late 80s. So I would, you know, we didn't have this thing you kids call email <laughs> and uh, the internets. So I would I would read a book about a different line of work and then go talk to people in that and see, you know, kind of what that was all about. So I was used to turning to books to read them. And uh, I'd been an English major, so <laughs> I guess I had read a fair number of books. So that's, uh, that's how I did that is I just remember reading it and thinking, you know, this is really helpful to me. And uh, that's why I focused on the books. But also, the thing with books is that uh, it's such an immersive experience. It's like you're spending a few hours with that author. Mm -hmm. Or it's like you're going away and getting deeply into um, that, whatever the subject matter is, particularly, you know, hopefully it's a, a well-written book and almost all the books that are on my show are really very well-written. And there's a quote from Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg, this guy that started Facebook, <clears throat> another, you know, another one of these kids. And he started a book club the same year that I started the Marketing Book Podcast. You know, he was, he, he wanted to be like me, of course. Of course. And, uh, he said, books allow you to fully explore a topic and immerse yourself in a deeper way than most media today. And it, it's interesting because when I'm reading a book or when an author, what happens now, I don't know if you can see it, but back behind me, there's gosh, a couple hundred books and there's oh, yeah. other, other stacks over there. There's, when somebody wants to be on the podcast or, you know, when somebody, I, I, so my point is that now almost every day there's people sending books, which is, you know, I'm, I'm delighted, which mm -hmm. is funny because when I started the podcast, I wasn't sure that 52 marketing books would be written every year. That was my <laughs> big, seriously, that's what I thought, wow. oh gosh, I'm going to be scraping, but, but there are evidently. And then I started reading sales. I started uh, interviewing authors of sales books, which I think are very important for marketing people to read almost more than marketing, so many marketing books exclusively, but I have to have a hard copy of the book. And that I look at it and then, cause I'm going to read the book, I'm going to mark it up, all that sort of thing. Uh, it's very rare that I'll read an electronic version and rare. I've only listened to one audio book and that was Joe Polizzi's book, which was a murder mystery. <laughs> he's, the, <laughs> he's the founder of the Content Marketing Institute. And even in that interview, which aired recently, uh, it, we didn't talk so much about the book because it's a mystery and we didn't want to give it all away. Yeah. But we did talk quite a bit about uh, content marketing. So and that, that's why that, I read. That's why I read the books. I, I they just. Uh, if I read something on a screen, I know there's some science behind this. I can't remember what it is. You tend to scan more. I okay. just don't retain the information as if I'm 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 reading it. But some just, of your, I, I suppose because our brains are susceptible to when we're on a screen, that's what we're we're kind of doing through emails and and short messages and yes, it's easy I to think scan. So. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it, maybe it's the that we're trained to do that. I mean, people don't really read on a screen the same way mm -hmm. um and we're, so anyway that's why yeah. cave drawings work better on a screen <clears throat> so that that episode you're talking about i actually listened to it bizarrely enough yesterday um and i think his his murder mystery book is about some kind of agency a marketing agency i think yes yes <laughs> a guy who's uh father passed away and his father was in the uh mortuary business the funeral business and he gets pulled into this um it's a murder mystery, conspiracy. It was uh, pretty exciting. But what happened was, and it's an interesting story for content marketers, Joe said that normally when an author r releases a book, there's a print version, an electronic version, and maybe an audio version at the same time. But what Joe wanted to do is build his audience more, which is what a lot of companies have done. They've built an audience before they try and sell to them. So he's released his audio book is the eight hour audio book for free on iTunes. It's called the will to die. So if you cool. like that sort of thing, you should listen to it. The electronic version is coming out in the spring of 2020. And then the summer of 2020, the print version. Well, when that happens, he's going to remove the free audio version, but he's trying to build the, his audience first. So he's doing it in the reverse order, but I think it's a very interesting content marketing approach. So 
he said, hey, hey, how about if I come back on? I said, yeah, I'd love to have you. You'll be one of the very few members of the Marketing Group Podcast Four Timers Club because he's written several other content marketing books. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did that. And I said, okay, well, can you send me the book? He goes, mm, it doesn't exist yet. I mean, it's, it's, it's all on audio. I said, okay. So I listened to it. But I even then, it was a different experience for me. I don't listen to these on audio book because you have to pay too much attention. It's just easier to read the book for me. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. It's probably just a very smart uh, scientist listening that you have in your audience that might be able to help us understand why that why it is retained better that way. It would be interesting to know as well. I just I just want to move on a little bit, and I've got a quote here from uh, David uh, Packard of Hewlett Packard, and he stated once that marketing is too important to be left just to the marketing department, which I I absolutely agree with. But on the same respect. I've always found it difficult, or companies that I've worked for found it difficult to encourage others to get involved in the marketing process. Mm -hmm. how, how can we get others or encourage others to get involved in that marketing process and show the value that marketing can bring? Well, let me mention a book because did I mention I read these books? So I've got, you got to be, you got to cut me off at some point because I'm going to say, oh, there was another book. Oh, there was sure. this book. Yeah, I love writing book prescriptions for people because I don't expect them to read <clears throat> hundreds of them, if I can suggest one or two that might mm -hmm. help them right now. But there was a book uh, called The 12 Powers of a Marketing Leader, and it was by Thomas Barda and Patrick Barwise. Patrick Barwise teaches at London Business School, and uh, Barda, who lives in Cologne, was a McKinsey partner, and it was a study using a lot of McKinsey data about perceptions of marketers and uh, uh, they, they interviewed a lot of marketers and then they, a lot of people had hired marketers and worked for them or, or were colleagues or for other departments. And they talked about how the most success, well, first off, the marketers have an image problem, which we can talk about later, but the most successful marketers are those that have this certain kind of leadership skill. And it doesn't mean commanding a platoon of soldiers. It means uh, a leadership of, uh, walking the halls and helping to reveal to their colleagues what is possible now with modern marketing and also why marketing is, has gone from plastic surgery to internal medicine. In other words, it used to be the make it pretty department. And now it has a whole lot to do, it has a whole lot to do with, with the experience that your customers have and uh, how that's really your most powerful uh, form of marketing. So they're, they're helping to reveal, and they do it in a many, many ways. They'll show what the competition's doing. They'll help their uh, colleagues to understand that the megaphone that we've used for 100 years is pretty much broken and nobody trusts it. Mm -hmm. they, trust their colleague, they trust their friends, and they even trust uh, recommendations from strangers more than they trust what a company says. So wow. they're... I, one of the things that helps the most is to um, show what your competition's doing. But if you're going to be successful, you need to be the first to do it. So as Seth Godin says, if you're waiting for a case study, you're going to be too late. One of the other things that marketers can do to help themselves to show uh, their leadership and to show the relevance is to tie as much as what they do to business goals. So and I give this talk all the time. And, you know, afterwards, I gave it uh, not too long ago. And uh, one of the guys came up to me, very sharp guy. And he says, yeah, you know, it's, it's so true. We're, we're known as the trade show guys. Hmm. We help the company prepare for the trade shows. And these are smart people. Uh, but they, they, what they want to do or what you should try to do is connect what you're doing with what your company's trying to accomplish. Now, a lot of people will say, yeah, but my company doesn't have any goals. Help them develop some. They're not expecting that from a marketing person. But mm. those are the types of things where, you know, at the, at the top of the, the idea here is there's more and more companies that are starting to make people the CEOs who have a marketing background because they understand which levers to pull to start growing revenue. In other words, you have to know, marketers have to know a whole lot more about why people buy and they have to know more about sales. They have to know about customer experience that's being engineered or provided. And so that's why uh, some of the more progressive companies are starting to realize that it, it really is about marketing. What, <clears throat> what one of the things he was talking about, David Packard was talking about is, is if you're abdicating it to your marketing department, you're really going to struggle. 
So it, it also brings to mind the quote from uh, the 20th century uh, management uh, expert, I would say guru, but I, I so disdain that, yeah, that word as it, as it relates to, to marketing. And uh, his name is, um, I just had it, um, Peter Drucker. Yeah. And you know, he says, business, you know, if, if a business is there to create customers, there's really only two things they need to be focusing on, innovation and marketing. Everything else is just a cost. Now, he was maybe being a little provocative, and in Mark Schaefer's recent book, Lessons, that was on the podcast, he talks about that. But, uh, you know, marketing, it, for folks that may be new to it, and this is something that always surprises folks when I talk about it, is I can, in 1960, there was a, a, a model called the four Ps of marketing, <laughs> which, which you may have heard of. And is it outdated? Sure. Has every marketing expert come up with the four A's or the four Q's or whatever? Yeah, fine. But this one still works because most companies don't have this framework. And it's marketing is about uh, your product and the, how it's priced and how it's distributed, meaning place. Only then should you be focusing on promotion. And so it short circuits so many companies I'll speak to. They'll say, hey, we need some marketing. And I say, okay, well, let's talk about some of these other things first. And it's like, I think marketing is actually going to hurt you. You guys actually have some other things you need to focus <laughs> on first. The other thing is there's another... Did I mention there's another book? There was a book called um, Beyond Product that was on the show by Jill Soley. And <clears throat> she and her co-author were uh, our Silicon Valley marketing veterans. And there's a reason they called it Beyond Product because so many people in that world, the tech world, but also most business, they're really focused on their product. They love talking about their product. And she's dealt with very smart Silicon Valley founders who basically have the frustration of, We've got this great product. Why are we not minting money? <laughs> and then she's having to explain to people, there's this thing called product market fit. Did you test it all for that? You know, and it's easy for us to sit here and say that. I can understand why these founders do that. But it, mm. was, it was that sort of thing where, you know, you might want to put the brakes on making a bunch of noise until you make sure you have some of these other things first. <laughs> So, so it, it's clear that there is a requirement in every single business for some form of marketing or marketer or some assistance within that uh, department. Last year, you were the keynote speaker at the AMA, American Marketing Association. And you said, which you touched on a couple of points there. And I'm glad and that you... was in Birmingham, Alabama, which was named after Birmingham, England. Love it. Bit of knowledge there. Yeah, you know all this useless information is right up here in my head. Don't at, you know? Don't don't try and take me on in trivial pursuit. But for really important information, I, I'm I'm at a loss. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, in that keynote speak um, keynote speech, you said that marketers have a serious image problem. So why is this, and how can we actually fix it? Well. Let's go to a survey uh, that was done by the Fournays Group in London a couple of years ago, a few years ago, and it was uh, 80% of CEOs did not trust their marketing people. And what they <laughs> meant by that is that, I mean, they would trust them to watch their kids probably, but they didn't trust that marketers are in touch with the financial realities of their company. And uh, just to quote, let me um, quote it from that same book, um, 12 Powers of Marketing Leader, uh, Mark Ritson, who is uh, based in London, he said, uh, they said, early in our study, we spoke with international CMOs about their work, asking, what do you do? It was interesting how many people answered. Some said things like, I manage the brand, or I run our marketing. <clears throat> Words like these don't go down well with company leaders. In the words of marketing professor and columnist Mark Ritson, too many marketers go into a room full of executives from their company and warble on about the need to build brand awareness and brand equity. No one gives a F <laughs> except you, and presumably you're already on board. Good marketers work out how to link what they do with what other stakeholders within the organization want. Employee retention, improved profits, clearer leadership, and the warble word, I thought that was a very good uh, UK word because we don't use it too much in, uh, here in the United States. So there are, uh, the way to get out of that, 
uh, is to do what they said in that very book, uh, get in the revenue camp, kind of like I was touching on earlier. And that's where you start to ask questions that are not expected of a lot of marketing people, but you start asking questions like, what are our company financial goals? A lot of hmm. marketers work for companies that have those, but they're not thinking about them or they haven't asked or they haven't been told. Go to your CFO, your chief financial officer or whoever and say, what, what kind of goals do we have? And they may not have any. So then you can start to exert some leadership and help maybe help to establish some. What are our company sales goals? If you have salespeople, I got to believe they have some sort of quotas. Okay, wh where did those quotas come from? There's some, at some point, your company, to use a military analogy, has said, take that hill. And the marketers don't even know which hill it is. Yeah. Uh, another way is to say, who is our most profitable customer? I ask that question of companies that uh, I interact with, and a lot of them, uh, they go, wow, oh, no, that's a good question. <laughs> well, you know, but it's like, well, why don't you focus on maybe uh, selling more to your current customers to get the fastest revenue growth? Or, or here's another one. I'll say, who are our worst customer? Who are our most least profitable customers? And quite often companies are able to say that pretty quickly. I say, okay, well, what, what characteristics do they have? Why are they not good for us? Uh, um, <clears throat> and then you can start to go to the other end of the continuum and say, well, who are the ones that are ideal? And then companies start dreaming like, wow, you mean we might be able to fire some of our bad customers and get more of the good ones? Here's another one that, that, that every marketer should have a handle on is what is the average lifetime value of our best customers? You know, everyone thinks about making that first sale, but a customer might be worth 10 times that mm -hmm. first sale. And this is, again, I see light bulbs go off over people's heads when I, I talk about this. I say, okay, so in other words, your every customer you bring in here is worth half a million dollars or whatever the number is. And they go, gosh, I didn't think of it that way. <laughs> well, yeah. You get a new customer, you get yourself an annuity for however long you tend to keep these folks as well as other things. So get in the revenue camp, start speaking the language of business, which is um, accounting. Here's another thing that marketers should not do. Don't, I know I'm going to upset some marketers here, but don't start using the word brand or branding. D don't say these words to civilians, okay, <laughs> outside the marketing part. Brands, branding, storytelling. Don't talk about uh, likes, uh, impressions, keep that to yourself. Just do yourself a favor and, and don't do that because so many people think of marketers as arts and crafts party planners who work in the make it pretty department. And these might be nice people. They just don't know what marketing does. But they think, uh, yeah, whatever you're doing, that's, that's great. You know, I still have a quota to meet. I love that phrase, arts and crafts. I think it just it, it sums it up perfectly for people that, that might not necessarily understand what marketing is, and it highlights what marketing fundamentally isn't. Right. Let me give you another example. Who is Liverpool's greatest opponent, biggest rival? So let's go, let's go with Manchester United. Okay, Manchester United. Ooh, man. And didn't you say Liverpool just beat them? <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they did, yeah. Okay, so... Let's say you get together with a bunch of Manchester United folks and they know you're from Liverpool, you're a Liverpool fan. There are certain things they're thinking about you. They, <laughs> they might not even like you. Now, if they got to know you, that'd be fine. But you see how their perception of you um, is probably not good just because you're a Liverpool fan. It's the same thing. They say, oh, they work in marketing. It's like, okay. You know, the, my hunch is that there's probably a lot of really, really nice Manchester United fans mm -hmm. i know you disagree but i <laughs> know no hang on no <laughs> <laughs> i'm kidding but <laughs> but but right off the bat you know and it's the same here in the united yeah. states with this uh with the nfl i've got a friend who just despises this his favorite team's opponent and i'm thinking really he goes, oh no they're bad people they you know it, it doesn't stop so it's like that these people think of you that way yeah. It's the same way with people who aren't marketing. They just think, oh, yeah, okay, great. That's fun. It's creative. And they think of marketing, as my colleague Pete has <laughs> mentioned it the other day, they think of marketing as buying some sort of lottery ticket. You know, like, oh, let's, let's take a chance. Let's try a little something. Maybe something will go viral, which is a terrible strategy that never works yeah. and is the bane of marketers. It's, it's such a bad idea. And we can talk more about that. But uh, rather, you know, marketing is more like uh, building a pyramid where I'm not talking about slave labor, but I'm talking about um, 
you know, it's, it's a series of small things you need to do. It's a slow and steady wins the race. It's, it's that sort of thing that gives you a real sustainable edge. It's like building a moat around a castle. I have mm-hmm. to use a reference that people in the UK will understand. And I joke <laughs> because uh, Mark Masters, he was the first author I interviewed on the show uh, about his book, The Content Revolution. No, wait. I can't remember. I'm sorry. He's going to kill me now. But it, uh, he, he had in the book a lot of references to castles. And I had to say, is it required by law that if you're a UK author, you do have to talk about kings and castles and you know, uh, a feudal system and all that sort of thing. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, it is. He was also the only author who uh, so far was drinking during the interview. So he's a, <laughs> he's a hoot, and I've encouraged all the other authors, authors to do that. But, yeah, so th- that's why they, that's kind of what they think of that. Sorry, I'll, let me, <clears throat> excuse me while I get down off my soapbox. <laughs> that's cool. No, I, I love that. Mark's actually been on, on the show. Uh, he was one of the first guests, actually. I was amazed. He, he, he came on like I'm a, a amazed you're here today. Uh, but he's just he's so outspoken but the 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 beauty of mark ritson is i've called him beautiful the beauty of mark ritson is the fact that whatever he says he can back up he can justify and and that's the best thing yeah he's he's a treasure yeah (laughs) absolutely just going back to to books and all the books you've actually read over the years has there been a change in style of writing or has it may remain like fairly consistent um, I, well, I, I don't know. This, this okay. may have always been this way. Um, but I've seen a few more books lately that have fables in them, which I find very interesting. And this is not a new thing. I mean, you know, people might argue that something like the Bible, it's full of stories, compelling stories to get a point across. So I don't think this is a new idea, <laughs> but uh, there have been some where the authors, well, it's either like a, the whole book is a fable, like uh, The Go-Giver by Bob Berg or uh, Be Like Amazon, even a lemonade stand can do it by the Eisenberg brothers, where the whole thing is like that, which is very interesting. And uh, Oren Claff had a new one, um, Called oh gosh he's gonna kill me he he wrote pitch anything and then um, his other book was had a lot of stories in it and uh, so I there was another one I really like called smash the funnel by these two fellas uh, who friends of mine who have an agency in Philadelphia and what they did is they wrote the book and then they rewrote it before the first one came out although I saw the first one in between every chapter they had the fable. So you were able to see what they were explaining, and then they took you through this story throughout the whole book. And it was about 100 extra pages, but it was brilliantly done. So I would hope that there are more books in the future that have these uh, fables. And there was uh, another book, a graphic novel by Rich Horwath. He was on the show, and it was like 170 pages of a graphic novel, and it was all about business strategy. (laughs) <laughs> and I just told him, I said, you've just made it so difficult for anyone else who's going to do this because I mean, it's very <laughs> difficult and very expensive to do one of those. But he did it, and it was really uh, compelling. And he said, yeah, I was hoping to <laughs> make it difficult for everyone else. Plus, you really have to know what you're talking about if you put it in a graphic novel. Yeah, it was called, uh, it was called Strategy Man versus the Anti-Strategy Squad. <laughs> wow, weird title as well. Yeah, well, it was these... Um, it was Strategy Man, who was the superhero, and he had two other uh, um, superheroes. And then there were 20, I think it was 20 villains. And these, these 20 villains are things that ruin strategy for a business. And they could okay. be things like uh, bad meetings or um, all these different kinds of things. And, I, of course, I've, it's as if I'd seen a movie on every one of those villains because I knew exactly what he was talking about. He personified <laughs> all these things that derail companies from pursuing a strategy and the reason you want to have a strategy is because you'll be more successful doing that absolutely just sticking with books and you read a lot of them uh, how do you get the best out of actually reading a book what are your hints and tips because you you pretty much read a book a week so like what's your tips for for doing that on a consistent basis well if you drink scotch while you're reading <laughs> It really goes quickly. <laughs> yeah. But I have to reread the ending because I will have forgotten it by the time I get to that. Um, I think you do have to choose carefully. You know, we've gone from an era of space to one of attention where 
you know, if you're not reading a book, you could be watching an interesting cat video or, you know, just doing something else that commands our attention because we can basically do whatever we want. So I would say, uh, you know, choose, choose carefully. And I think that's where a podcast like mine is helpful or, or, or many other places where you can read reviews on, on, uh, online. You can listen to an author talk. <clears throat> you can, um, uh, you know, just, just research it. I would also say uh, kind of make, try to make a plan for what you want to learn more about. Hmm. Um, so it's like sometimes they'll say, people will say, what's one book I could read to learn more about marketing and I could recommend a book, but it's sort of like, well, what, what are your specific challenges? So like every day I'm messaged by folks, listeners from around the world who are looking for a book recommendation because they're trying to save time and I, I want to help them because mm. <laughs> I've already navigated, you know, a little bit further than they have on some of these things. And they'll ask me some questions, but I usually have to ask a follow-up question like, well, let's be more specific because I want to make sure that I, I recommend the right one. So <clears throat> think about what it is you want to do. Um, you can also join a book club. There's a lot of book clubs. I think there's even online book clubs. Um, I think for a nonfiction books, you can certainly check out almost every author has a blog where you can read oh, yeah. more about what they're doing. Um, you can watch uh, talks they've given to see if that's uh, the itch that you want to scratch. Um, and uh, the other thing that's helpful in reading a book is to kind of make it a habit. So people say, well, how do you read so many books? And I say, well, it's, it's kind of a priority. Uh, in other words, if people say you don't have time for something, it really just means it's not a priority, which yeah. is fine. I mean, my kids are in their 20s now. It's not like I'm having to watch them. Uh, they, they should probably be watching me at this point. But they, <clears throat> it, it, so I, I have the time to do it, but it's just more of a priority. So instead of watching maybe as much television or uh, doing other kinds of things during my week, there's a couple of times where I sit down for a couple hours and read them. So I'll read for an hour or two on Saturday, maybe on Sunday, and then a couple mornings a week for an hour, uh, like before I go to work or something like that if I, if I need to get through it. Um, so you, if you, if you can, it's like anything, if you can make it a habit, that's good. Um, mm. and, uh, you know, I, 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 I think if you could just read 12, you know, if you make, uh, 12 to a year, you would, you would, you, know, you would still be way ahead of, of, uh, of most folks. So also, you know, what you could do is you could organize a book club, like with your colleagues at work or whatever group you're in. Like if you're in a local marketing association or whatever, set up a, a book club. Uh, for mm -hmm. instance, they're at salesforce.com in uh, London. They, a lot of folks work there and they listen to the podcast. And so they set up a, a book club for cool. all these people that work there. And when they first started it, they had me Skype in, <laughs> you know, just to kind of, um, help out. And I was, I was delighted to do it. And it was a whole lot of fun. And I'm happy to do that for any of your, uh, any of your listeners who, who might want to, to do that Brilliant. Um, to, to get them started. So um, that's, uh, that, that's, that, that's kind of how you have to be careful. But it, it is, it's a good question because, you know, we're so overwhelmed with all these, with <clears throat> all these options for our attention. Yeah. Speaking of all the options and, and, and different elements and things you've learned in, in a, a lot of reading, one of your recent episodes, you ran through and the title, I think, was Three Big Ideas from 250 Marketing and Sales Books. Every marketer needs to know. So what are these three big ideas we need to know? Okay. The first one we've talked about, marketers have an image problem. And I can include a link to the episode. It was episode 251 where I gave this talk, but it also includes all the slides and script. Cool. So your, your listeners can have all that and they don't need to register. They just click on it and download it and it's all theirs. Um, so one of them is marketers have an image problem. And <clears throat> the sooner that you acknowledge that, uh, the more successful you're going to be. It doesn't mean that you are an arts and crafts party planner. Mm -hmm. Just understand that and try to get into the revenue camp in, in, in what you do. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about that. So there's no need to beat that dead horse anymore. The second one is that the most successful companies, the most successful marketers have the deepest insights into their customers. Okay, now, what that means is not that they call their customers up and say, what do you want? That was it's a 100% wrong approach. <laughs> it means that you observe your customers and you, under, you have a little bit of empathy, which is the most important word in marketing and sales. And it's also mm -hmm. the most difficult thing for humans to have. And empathy is not some sorrow, compassion, pity. It's putting yourself in the shoes of someone else. 
And you don't have to be perfect at that. Even if you're just a little bit good at it, you'll be more successful than your competition. So you observe them. It's like uh, Amazon. You know, they're obsessed with observing their customers uh, and how to remove friction from their customers' lives if, if they can possibly help with that. So that's where if you pay enough attention to your customers, they're going to tell you what they want or they're, excuse me, they're going to reveal how you can be more successful. Mm -hmm. But it's a matter of doing that. And the problem is that, you know, as I said in the talk, there's three kinds of companies, really. Uh, the, the companies that are focused on themselves and their products and their operations, which I think is most companies, yep. or at least the majority. And then there's some companies that are focused primarily on their competition. It doesn't mean they're not focused on themselves and their operations and all that. But, and they won't admit this, but their strategic decisions are based on whatever the competition is doing. You know, monkey see, monkey do, that sort of thing. And then there's the smaller number of companies that are really focused on their customers. And Amazon's an example of that, where they're just, I think uh, Bezos, let's see, I got the quote here. He says, our number one conviction and idea and philosophy and principle is customer obsession as opposed to competitor obsession. So that's where buyer personas come in handy and mm -hmm. all, that, all that type of thing. Um, and the third thing is that the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the most powerful marketing that companies have now is the experience that their customers have interacting with them. So you can see how that's a challenge for marketers because they don't, <laughs> they're, not con they're not in control of that customer experience. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where we go back to David Packard's thing. His quote about marketing is too important to be left to the, to the marketing department. It really needs to be whoever's in charge, making sure that people have a good experience. So you've heard of mystery shoppers or, you know, if, if you're able to sit down and say, well, now what actually happens when a customer interacts with us? Um, again, back to empathy, you know, you're able to say, wait a minute, we're making them sit on hold for four minutes. Ooh, <laughs> gosh, did nobody notice that? Or, you know, or, or th there's just certain things where they uh, are having a bad experience. So the more successful companies are saying, oh, well, Tell you what, let's engineer it so that um, people don't have that bad experience. For instance, where I live, there's a, an air, a heating and air conditioning company that I, I'm a customer. And when you have to buy a new unit, uh, which is maybe every 10 years or something, if they schedule in a, a day to install it, you, know, you have to take off work and you have to be there while they're uh, putting it in. If for any reason they have to change the day, they'll give you $500. Yeah. If anyone smokes or uses tobacco or swears while they're on your property, believe it or not, they'll give you $500. And the reason they hardly have to pay anything out, mm -hmm. but the reason the owner of the company is doing that is because he wants that information. Not so he can yell at his people, but he can say, oh, what, what, what broke down in the system here? Why did we have to reschedule? You know, well, yeah. why are we hiring these or what, how are we training these people not to behave professionally around our customers? Th things like that. So they really understand that it's this, this customer experience you deliver. And just a word of caution to marketers. Let's say the boss is listening to this show or they read it on an in-flight magazine and they come in on Monday and say, okay, we're all about customer experience. And just so you know, that's called management by in-flight magazine. They then turn to the marketing person and say, all right, you're in charge of marketing. You're in charge of customer experience. If you're a marketer, you need to say no. <laughs> because you can't control all that. And you need, unless, you're, unless that boss is dead serious about making this work, they're going to say, ah, oh, we tried customer experience. It doesn't work. And, and you can't, it's not like you can control deliveries or you, there's so much the marketer doesn't control there. So it kind of goes back to helping your company understand that your customer experience is really much more important. And the reason why, for those that are doubting Thomas's, is that in the past, you could tell 10 of your neighbors or whatever if you had a bad experience with a customer or with a company. But now you can tell the world. Everybody has a megaphone. Mm -hmm. You know, you can write a song about how United Airlines breaks guitars and won't <laughs> refund your money, and it decreases the value of that company's stock by 10%, which was billions of dollars everybody that's why it used to be buyer beware you know caveat emptor mm -hmm. 
now it's seller beware. <laughs> because yeah. even if your customer didn't have a bad experience, they can go tell everyone. So it's, it's changing the way companies are, are running. It's, it's, it's changing governments. <laughs> it's, everyone has a, has a megaphone now. And if it's compelling enough, a lot more people are going to find out about it. Just think about reviews. So yep. that, that was the third one is about the, the customer experience. And so I think some people that watched this talk maybe thought, oh, gosh, there's so much more for me to do. But um, hopefully folks were inspired and, and maybe some of their bosses can understand that uh, the, the David Packard quote. Yeah, absolutely. And a customer experience, it's got to be customer, customer. It's got to be company-wide. It just has to be because every touch point is crucial. Yeah. And, you know, just to add to that, um, there was a, a book on the show called Mean People Suck. It was the 250th episode by Michael Brenner. And it was all about empathy. And uh, he had this uh, smart idea. You know how an organizational chart might look for a business? Mm -hmm. where it's got like a box at the top and a line down and then it goes to two boxes and then to three boxes. He said, that's part of the reason why customer experience is so hard for companies. And he proposed a, a very smart uh, new approach to the org chart. And basically at the center is the customer. Huh. And then every, every line and box needs to somehow be connected into how does it impact the customer? And the smarter companies are starting to realize that even accounting, finance, billing, you know, delivery, uh, returns, those are all customer-facing departments, even though they might not have thought of themselves that way. And there was another book called um, on the show called Nincompoopery, Why Your Customers Hate You and How to Fix That. And he, talked, he, he used this term throughout the book that was very funny. He called, uh, let's say you still have some non-customer facing departments, <laughs> non-customer or no customer free zones. I think that's what he called <laughs> it. customer free zones. You better not have any more customer free zones because if people think that, yeah, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't have to deal with the customer. Eh, yeah, you, you might. You might actually be more customer facing than you, than you realize. I, I love the fact that you put the customer in the center and then there's lines going to everybody. And who isn't going to want to be close to that customer? You know, the further away, it's almost like the, the less relevant you are. You're like, no, 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 put me closer to the customer. Put me and closer. less job security. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's just the connotation of having that written down somewhere. That's, yeah, yeah. that's genius. Well, Absolute it's also genius. a way for the, the, the leadership to say, look, guys, it, it really needs to be about the customer. If they can just do that in, in the way they operate and the way they think, uh, they're going to be uh, more successful. Mm -hmm. So Douglas, you've, you've given so much value so far. And, and with all the uh, chats that I have with my amazing guests, I finish on quick fire questions. So are you ready for these? Yes. Except uh, what's the last thing you Googled? Oh gosh. I'll have to think about that. I, well, actually, can't we look through the history? Uh, maybe I don't want to answer that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, anyway, uh, let me see here. Well, I'm, I'm giving away what one of them was. Yeah, absolutely. Let's start with that. Yeah. What was the see. last thing you Googled? I'm trying to see. Uh, oh, <laughs> it was about um, <laughs> the Senate Majority Leader in the United States. Uh, there's a, an impeachment going on, which is this uh, trial and of the uh, president and the head of the Senate, the Senate majority leader is named Mitch McConnell. And he is sometimes known as cocaine Mitch, <laughs> not because he's, I don't think he uses cocaine, but it was based on some funny TV commercial that a candidate had who was running in a recent Senate campaign and i told a couple colleagues here about that and they weren't familiar with the whole cocaine mitch thing so i i looked at the guy's name was don blankenship cocaine mitch it was a really funny ad and the guy fortunately he lost but it was uh, a bit terrifying so that's that was the last thing i googled i know that was your second question i'm sorry so no yeah absolutely fine when you started talking about the senate and impeachment i thought this is just going to be the most boring answer we've ever had for that question yeah. <laughs> you turned it around quite well well, thank you. And, and normally I am told how boring I am. So I, you know, but that was just today. Uh, so. <laughs> and that's when you start drinking the scotch. Yes, that's right. That's right. Cool. Uh, I hate to ask this question, but what is your go-to source of information? Well, wouldn't it be Google? Well, I, 
I thought it was going to be books, but. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, well, oh, the first one. Well, okay, yeah, I, I guess you're right. I don't know why you would have thought that because it didn't occur to me, but it's sort of like if I've read a top, I've read about a book about a particular topic, I end up not reading a whole lot about it like on other blogs and things because I feel mm -hmm. like I kind of, I kind of got it. Um, I can certainly keep up by reading uh, blogs and, and, and other things like that. But mm. yeah, I guess it would, I guess and rather than go to source, yeah, it would be sort of the definitive source. <clears throat> However, yeah. there are a lot of topics that aren't, books aren't written about necessarily. So cool. So if you could tell your 10 year old self one thing, what would it be? Oh, I would think it would be uh, beware of old guys claiming to be the future me. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. Um, Final two questions, probably the most important two questions of this whole chat. The first one is, can you judge a book by its cover? Well, whether you can or can't, I certainly do. And I'm sorry, <laughs> but it forms an impression. And, you know, yeah. one, one thing I've learned from books is that 90% of what's going on in the brain is subconscious. You don't even know what's going on there. A lot of it has to do with uh, keeping ourselves alive and, uh, you know, being more like cavemen. Um, but I think that um, it certainly helps. I, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a one particular publisher and they must not even be going on Fiverr to get their book covers designed because they're, I mean, I think even I could do better and I'm, I'm not a graphic designer. And over time I've read enough of their books and I'm thinking, do you guys even have editors? <laughs> so it doesn't hurt. Absolutely. Final question, most important question. If people want to find the Marketing Book Podcast, find out more about yourself and what you do and, and your other company, where should they go? Well, ideally, it would be any fine watering hole in uh, Liverpool. Uh, <laughs> yes. But since I've never been to Liverpool, but one of these days I'm going to get there. Get yourself uh, over. I, you will not regret it. Oh, I know. I already looked it up on Wikipedia and I'm thinking, man, what a cool place to go to. Hmm. Uh, and not just because of the Beatles, but there's so many museums and, yep. and that sort of thing. And then, of course, you would be required to take me to a Liverpool game. Yeah, uh, obviously. So, uh, or match, I'm sorry, match. <laughs> um, the uh, marketingbookpodcast.com is where they can find the podcast section of our website. Uh, on I'm on LinkedIn and I love uh, connecting with folks on LinkedIn. And then talking back and forth where I'm able to recommend something that's going to help save them time. Uh, but uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Otherwise, they can go to marketingbookpodcast.com to find the um, podcast and where they can subscribe to it. Um, all, on Twitter, I'm on, on Twitter, I am marketing book, but I don't really go on Twitter that much anymore. <laughs> it's just, anyway, um, so uh, that's, that's how they can find me. And my company is, uh, website is salesartillery.com. Love it. Douglas, thank you so, so much for, for coming on today. It's been an absolute pleasure. My pleasure. And uh, let me know about those bookmarks. Anybody wants one? Once again, Douglas, thank you so, so much for joining us on the Marketing Study Lab podcast. And just time for some quick takeaways that I got from that very, very interesting chat with Douglas and his books. Oh, and his scotch. My first takeaway is quite simply the fact that Douglas is so generous with his time and knowledge. And if you're struggling to find a book that fits your specific requirements, he'll more than happily advise you on what you should be reading. Get in touch with him. And don't forget to ask for your marketing book podcast bookmark. Remember the three big ideas Douglas spoke about that every marketer needs to know right now. Number one, Correct the image problem that marketers have, and you might have to do this in your own organization. Number two, get those deep insights into your customers. It will pay dividends later on. And number three, make those customers happy. And this revolves around the good experiences we can create for them. And finally, if you want to be a good reader, not waste time, be consistent, learn, and enjoy what you're reading, Douglas advises us to do the following. Number one, be specific about what you read and which authors you choose. Number two, which follows on from this, is read the author's blogs to see if you like the style of writing and what they're actually writing about. Number three, don't be afraid to ask for recommendations. Why not 
pop Douglas a little cheeky email or DM. It can narrow the field down immensely and save you a lot of time reading stuff that you just don't find relevant or interesting. And finally, number four, make it a habit. Set aside some time. Try to fit reading into your daily or weekly schedule, just like you would go in the gym, eating, or having a cheeky little scotch. Thank you so much for joining us today on Marketing Study Lab. It really means the world that you're listening to this out there. And hopefully I've provided you some value. If you're looking to know more about what Marketing Study Lab does and is about, go to marketingstudylab.co.uk or get in touch with me personally, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or feel free to email me at peter at marketingstudylab.co.uk. Happy marketing. Oh.